Okay, let's start with prayer. This last session of cultural anthropology. Father God, we thank you uh, for these past seven weeks, for the things that we learn about uh, cultures, about people of different cultures, and the you know the things that we need to be careful the complexities of cultures and similarities, differences, and that everyone needs the gospel. Father God, help us to present your gospel in a way that is clear, uh, it is understandable for people of other cultures, but also it's true to your text. Uh, we commit this last session into your hand, and I again pray for all the, all the students, whether in class or online, that you bless them, uh, not only for this course, but for the other courses that they're taking. And may it be that the things that we have learned uh, be used practically in our lives and our ministries. Uh, we commit this last session to your hand and ask your blessing upon all the dear students. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Uh, do you have any question before we go to our PowerPoint? No, okay. Uh, let's then go to share. And make this. Okay, for the, those who are taking this class for us credit, Remember, the final exam will be from session five through seven after the midterm. A um, <clears throat> few things are just left. Some of them we have discussed in length uh, in previous sessions from Dr. Hibbert's textbook like contextualization, but Howell and Paris again talk about what is pastoral anthropology. Uh, in other words, actually, how to use anthropology in a, a service of the church. And that's basically is when we use ethnographic techniques, that's when we use that course, you know, MI651. Uh, that's where that course comes from, MI611, 612, and 651, where we gather uh, information about culture, history, language, geography, economy, religious background of different people and we want to use those information in, uh, for two purposes, how to communicate the gospel and, and how to uh, disciple and plant churches. Uh, we gather this information about where the church located, the demographies of the church and the uh, community, the social and spiritual needs of both church and the community. Uh, so in a way, you need to do this also. It's not just the, the community because you may go to a country or to a culture that there's a church already there. So, but you need to know uh, even the ethnogra ethnographic detail of that church, where the people come from, their social status, economic status, their rel religious need, and also the community. So it should be done on both sides. Uh, contextualization, we talked about this in detail from Dr. Hibberturk's book, but basically is to take the gospel and make it meaningful, um, to communicate the gospel in a meaningful way to other cultures so that they can understand it. Uh, Hibbert and Paris, they use uh, organically woven in the context. Uh, fitting the gospel with the language, idioms, custom, tradition of a culture so that Christianity become organically part of that culture. It will not be foreign. Um, at, but I also keep emphasizing you need to be careful to be true to the text of the scripture. Uh, you got to watch out for syncretism. You know, somebody, someone may unknowingly cross the border and from contextualization you go to the syncretism so you've got to keep your eyes both on the text and the culture and uh, the, the text of the scripture has supremacy actually 
over the over all cultures. But if you just want to explain that the message of the text, the message of the gospel in a way that is understandable for people of other cultures, if there is going to be a stumbling block, let it be the cross, not us. <laughs> you know, like uh, a few sessions ago, we watched that video that missionary was explaining that if I go and wanted to explain the gospel to a group of Muslim people, but I have in, in one, of, one hand, I have a, a can of beer, and in the other hand, I have a, a you know, piece of ham, um, uh, that will not go very well. Uh, uh, so if there is going to be a, a stumbling block, let that stumbling block be the cross, not us. Now, a very important thing about other cultures is don't think other cultures are monolithic. Uh, you are planning to go to uh, Nepal. Uh, it's not, a, I mean, I, I don't have detailed studies of the culture of Nepal, but I doubt that it, it's a monolithic culture since there is no country in the world that has a monolithic uh, culture, you know, Middle Eastern countries, Islamic cultures, they are not monolithics. Uh, I've always mentioned that uh, Muslims in America, I'm reading a book about next module, I'm teaching a course on Islamic studies, and my, the history of Islam in America. Uh, the Muslim in America are very different than the Muslim in the Middle East. And by the Muslim in America, I'm not talking about the Middle Easterners who have come here. I'm talking about uh, the converse mainly from African American, uh, Black Americans. Uh, uh, they are very, very different than Middle Easterners, uh, Islam, Muslims. Um, and even those who, who have come from Middle Eastern countries, they are different than the uh, Muslims in their own country. I mentioned I pastor a church here in San Diego. Uh, also, I'm involved with a church, underground church in Iran, and these two churches are very different. <laughs> so, it's a, lots of time I have to just sit and be quiet and listen to what they say to understand what's going on before I say anything. Even though I came from Iran and they are from Iran, I'm Christians and they are Christians. But I'm here, they're over there, and uh, these two are very different. Uh, in, as I said, even in a country, in one country, you take Iran, India, you know, India is a huge example because it has many, many subcultures. Uh, even smaller countries like Nepal, Thailand, uh, Japan, they have many subcultures. Now, what is a subculture? It's basically a group within a larger group, within a larger culture that define itself in opposition to that larger group, in distinction from the majority. Like an example here in America would be the Amish. Amish are Christians, but they are a subculture of Christianity. Christianity in America, unfortunately, it is becoming a subculture by itself. And even within that subculture, you have another subculture that is Amish, or you have many others. But Amish, uh, uh, Amish are a subculture of a subculture of Christianity in America. Um, <coughs> when you look at them, you may not first recognize their differences from other farmers in Indiana, but uh, you, you, you will notice some things that are peculiar about them, for example, all of their tools for farming, uh, they're all powered, or they're horsepower. They're, there is no uh, electric car or engine, anything. There are no machines, no cars. They have their own school, and usually the school, uh, from what I've heard, uh, they teach in German, because that's where they come from. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 that's what I have heard. Uh, they might teach it as a second. Oh, maybe, maybe. I don't think they're speaking just German. Oh, okay, yeah, maybe. Maybe 
uh, as generation have passed, then the, the, they have this, they have the same problem like uh, the rest of the immigrant like us. You know, the, our children, uh, they're just they flow, they go with the uh, general dominant culture. <laughs> um, uh, but they have their own schools, they have their own communes, um, their form of Christianity, Anabaptists, you know, fine, they're good Christians, but it's a subcultures, uh, subculture of a Christianity, and uh, they have existed since 7th century. They come from um, uh, the post-Reformation, almost, uh, you know, post-Reformation, you know, yeah, almost. Uh, they felt that reformers didn't go far enough, so they are they are they go farther than Luther and Calvin and Zwingli's. But they are very interesting people. Um, there's a video clip I encourage you to watch. It's not. It has nothing to do with that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I would use that in future uh, for this class, what is called Amish Grace. I don't know if you have heard about that. It's a video clip, uh, it's on YouTube, and it's based on a true story that happened 2008, I think, maybe 2009, 2008 or 2000. It's a true event that there was a, a man who was really uh, depressed and you know, emotionally unstable. He had lost his uh, daughter, I think, due to some kind of illness. And he was a, I mean, I didn't know that these people are still exist in America. Milkman, he would deliver milks and things like that. <laughs> and he went to a, a, a village in Pennsylvania, uh, was a uh, Amish uh, village. And he had called his wife that he's going to kill people. And he took gun, went to one of their schools, started shooting the people. I don't know. Yeah. And it's just an amazing story about how uh, he killed himself. I think that's what happened. But the Amish people forgave him and forgave. I mean, they didn't hold any grudges against his family. They, in fact, went and ministered to his family while. The report, I mean, the whole, all the reporters just came uh, upon that village and they were just in some ways uh, attacking the family. But these Amish people took them under their own protection and showed them love. And it's amazing. I uh, never forget there's one scene that there's this reporter and they're almost mad. Why, why you forgive? Uh, that man, or why you forgive uh, his family? And they asked this Amish guy, and <clears throat> he just uh, to, turns to the reporter and says, "Because our Lord has commanded us," and that's it. No more explanation. It's a command of our Lord. That's it. <laughs> no argument. And you could see the people are just all these uh, uh, reporters and. Um, experts who are trying to analyze what's going on were frustrated <laughs> by the reaction of the Amish. But, the story. Yeah. They want the story, they want the drama. Yeah, they, they, the they just can't handle it, the, the message of the gospel. It's a great, great video play. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, another concept in our chapter is about uh, indigenization, in other words, making the church, again, we want to be careful about syncretism, but you want the church to be indigenous church. You want the church, if it's a Thai, uh, or if it's a Nepali church, you want it to be part of that culture, part of that society. True, uh, first and foremost, true, they must be committed to the scripture, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't want to make replica, for example, of uh, American churches. Pro if, only if, 
I mean, if there's an area that if I see a church in America, I mean, of course, there are many of them who are committed to the Lord and are committed to scripture. Yes, I want to do that. But I want if when you have, uh, there are a number of them, uh, Dr. Jeremiah, John MacArthur, different guys um, who are great Bible expositor. Yeah, that's great to do have those as a model. But you got even in those cases, you need to remember that there are things that they unknowingly because of their background, uh, when they speak, uh, it's to their own culture. As much as they want to be uh, biblical, but there's no human being, there's none of us uh, who is culturally neutral. <laughs> we are all uh, uh, product of our, in some ways, product of our culture. So you got to be careful. But in other words, you need, um, in a, this uh, indigenization is another term for contextualization. But again, you got to be careful that it doesn't merge into syncretism. Now, if you look at this text, Mark chapter 140 through 41, it's very interesting. There are a number of elements of anthropology you can find here. This is a leper came to Jesus and begged him, if you so will, you can make me clean. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. Um, the elements I ask, what elements of anthropology can you detect in these two verses? Before I answer, would you like to give it a try? <laughs> I'm sorry, ask that question again. Uh, for, just in these two verses, this simple incident of this uh, leper who was a beggar who came to Christ and asked him to, if you, if you will, if you want, you can make me clean. What elements of anthropology can we see here? Well, um, the leper comes from a, a different, um, and I'm sorry, okay. Well, the, um, he, he may not have even been Jewish. Um, it doesn't really say. He may, he may have come from a different culture completely. Um, and, and he was from a different community of lepers. So he wasn't part of the group that Jesus would have been associated with because of his disease. <clears throat> um, so is, am I on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You know, even if, let's say, if he, even if he was a Jewish person, uh, but he belonged to a subculture, subculture of lepers and beggars, and actually a sub-subculture, because he was a beggar, but not just an ordinary beggar, he was a leper who is also a beggar. Okay, so it's a sub-subculture. And the thing is interesting is, like, you know, I'm not saying that the Lord was an anthropologist, but actually, in a way, the supreme anthropologist is the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he knows our in and out because he, he has created us. But he came, he dwelt among us like an anthropologist, if we, make, if we want to make a comparison. Like an anthropologist, he dwelt among us. He lived among us. He shared the people's uh, pain, people's joy, people's sorrow, people's funeral, and people's wedding. Uh, he participated in all these. He moved uh, among them. That's why this beggar was able to come to him and ask him for help. He wasn't just uh, in some kind of uh, palace or in some kind of like the gurus uh, sit, sitting in a mountain. No, he, he lived among people. He dwelt among people, and this man comes to him and asks him for help. And you also see, you know, an, a true anthropologist should have interest in people. They're not just a case study, but should have interest. In fact, I say this to all missionaries and evangelists. Don't treat people as a, some kind of project. I remember years ago, somebody told me that, uh, you know, okay, they, she knew or he knew, they, they were a couple. 
of some unbelievers uh, from another country. And they say, oh, that would be an interesting project to work on. And to be honest with you, I didn't like that vocabulary because I said people are not projects. People are human beings. Work with them, but you know, you got to have your mindset uh, turned in a proper way. You look at them as human beings that created in God's image and they need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he dwelt among them. He had he felt pity. See, it's interesting. He moved with pity. He had a feeling of sorrow. And he stretched out and touched him and say, said, I will be clean. Uh, so, you know, it's amazing. If you, you can uh, look at the gospel and you can look at Christ. I call him the supreme anthropologist. And you can find so many interesting uh, uh, details about how he can be a great model for anthropologists. And in fact, that term anthropology, remember the first class, study of human being, well, he is the supreme because he's the one who has created us. He knows what's going on. He knows what, what are our real needs. Okay, let's move on. Now, the last chapter from Dr. Hibbert, he talks about Population growth, some of the contemporary issues facing mission. Population growth, urbanization, cultural crisis, nationalism, and revival of non-Christian religion. Population growth, you are, we are facing some amazing uh, situations and just amazing statistics. Uh, the city that I was born, city of Tehran, I heard the population is about 12 million people. And in fact, I heard sometime during daytime, it reaches to 15 or 16 million people. When I lived there, there were only 3 million people. I mean, that's four or five times uh, of the time when I was there. I heard Mexico City, something about like 20 million. God, I mean, that's larger than some countries. <laughs> uh, no. Population growth and urbanization are issues facing contemporary mission, but they can also work in our advantage. Because if you notice, when you look at the, God, the book of Acts, the places that Paul went, they were very, uh, they, were, they were random. He, he, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, chose places that were the were major center of uh, uh, those societies. He went to major cities. Uh, he went to major uh, areas that there were people there, planted the church, planted the gospel so that from there the gospel can spread to other areas. If you notice, um, Paul focus where it was uh, basically the urban ministry, focusing on the urban area, not ignoring or neglecting rural area, but his, I think his idea was that by reaching the city, we can, they can spread the gospel to the urban area. And uh, one of the problem I think we are facing is unfortunately, Christians are fleeing the cities, inner cities and going to the rural area. And I think that's working against us. Um, when I lived in Chicago, when I went to seminary, Trinity over there, in fact, there were churches who intentionally wanted to come back to the inner city or churches that didn't want to move. And there were many, many good churches in Chicago that they all moved out of the inner city. And what you see in the inner city was a growth of all kind of uh, either non-Christian religions or cults and uh, strange groups <laughs> in inner city areas. Uh, no, was, Why did the churches leave? Uh, because people left. Because those uh, usually those areas became unsafe, a uh, problem with crime, gang. Then if you are sending your kids to public school, oh, I mean... I will never send my kids. I mean, 
uh, my kids are grown up now. Uh, I never, I will, I tell to people, don't send them to public school anywhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the situation, but especially in Chicago. Oh, I mean, it's a, just a, like a war zone <laughs> over there. <laughs> I think it was President Trump or somebody said it's worse than areas like than Iraq, <laughs> the fighting that's going on in some of these public schools. It's sad. I shouldn't laugh, but it's just... No, it's, it is sad, but it's, if it's true, how, so the only way to correct that would be to move you know, I understand that situation. Like I put myself, well, I don't want my kid to go to an unsafe school. So if, and I can't afford, you know, um, when my son went to a public school at his time, it was okay. I mean, we had some problem, but it was overall, it was okay. But at the time of my daughter, which was only three years different, in three years, Things change so much. I mean, I said, oh, no, you will never do it again. Uh, well, I mean, I don't have any other kid. Uh, but, uh, you know, I can understand. I mean, I, I don't want my kids to become missionaries in public school. Yeah. I mean, they are, they are, they are kids. They, they need protection and nurture. Um, and if I cannot afford to send them to a Christian school or private school, which I couldn't, and I still can't do that, then, you know, somebody in my situation, uh, you're forced to send them to public school, then I prefer to go somewhere that at least have better public school. Of course, right now, there's another option, and that's homeschool. And I recommend that to people highly, because many people cannot afford uh, Christian schools, uh, and uh, if you send your kid to public school, you just basically have lost them. It's bad, very bad. Um, you know, cultural crisis, we talked about that. You know, you know, we deal with the question of violence, like you don't have to go overseas. Uh, you know, a city like Chicago, even parts of San Diego, uh, poverty and hunger, oppression, injustice. You know, I, I share this story. You know, when I was there in Chicago for my school, my home church invites me every, every other year to come and speak at their mission conference. And that was an inner church, inner city church. I chose that. It was a, it's a very good church. Armitage Baptist Church. It's in uh, inner city Chicago, North Kadzi area. Excellent, wonderful ministry. And sometimes they used to, uh, if, I, if I was by myself, they would put me, they had missionary apartments. Uh, they would put me in one of their missionary apartments. <laughs> I'm, I will never forget, it was night, and it was nice, it was snowing, very nice. You don't see a snow here. Uh, I'm just sitting and I was listening to uh, MBI, Moody Bible Institute Radio. Uh, but outside, you could hear the gunshots every so often. I mean, it was, it was as if normal. You could hear that. But boy. Uh, now, what's urbanization uh, and why this is an issue for contemporary mission? Because, again, people moving to cities, it can have both positive and negative, as I mentioned. The positive thing is that then you can focus on the city and uh, you know if you hit the city then the gospel can uh, com tra communicate it from there to other parts of the society. The negative part is as I said Christians are fleeing the inner cities. Uh, urbanization is a physical and growth of rural and natural land into urban areas uh, as a result of population immigration the existing uh, urban area. Uh, okay, before we go to this nationalism, I, we have a, um, there's a video on urbanization. Let's watch that.
More than half of all people in the world live in an urban area. By mid-century, this will increase to 70%. But as recently as 100 years ago, only 2 out of 10 people lived in a city. And before that, it was even less. How have we reached such a high degree of urbanization? And what does it mean for our future? In the earliest days of human history, humans were hunter-gatherers, often moving from place to place in search of food. But about 10,000 years ago, our ancestors began to learn the secrets of selective breeding and early agricultural techniques. For the first time, people could raise food rather than search for it, and this led to the development of semi-permanent villages for the first time in history. Why only semi-permanent, you might ask? Well, at first the villages still had to relocate every few years as the soil became depleted. It was only with the advent of techniques like irrigation and soil tilling about 5,000 years ago that people could rely on a steady and long-term supply of food, making permanent settlements possible. And with the food surpluses that these techniques produced, it was no longer necessary for everyone to farm. This allowed the development of other specialized trades and by extension, cities. With cities now producing surplus food as well as tools, crafts, and other goods, there was now the possibility of commerce and interaction over longer distances. And as trade flourished, so did technologies that facilitated it, like carts, ships, roads, and ports. Of course, these things required even more labor to build and maintain, so more people were drawn from the countryside to the cities as more jobs and opportunities became available. If you think modern cities are overcrowded, you may be surprised to learn that some cities in 2000 BC had population densities nearly twice as high as that of Shanghai or Calcutta. One reason for this was that transportation was not widely available, so everything had to be within walking distance, including the few sources of clean water that existed then. And the land area of the city was further restricted by the need for walls to defend against attacks. The Roman Empire was able to develop infrastructure to overcome these limitations, but other than that, modern cities as we know them didn't really get their start until the Industrial Revolution, when new technology deployed on a mass scale allowed cities to expand and integrate further, establishing police, fire, and sanitation departments, as well as road networks and later electricity distribution. So what is the future of cities? Global population is currently more than 7 billion and is predicted to top out around 10 billion. Most of this growth will occur in the urban areas of the world's poorest countries. So how will cities need to change to accommodate this growth? First, the world will need to seek ways to provide adequate food, sanitation, and education for all people. Second, growth will need to happen in a way that does not damage the land that provides us with the goods and services that support the human population. Food production might move to vertical farms and skyscrapers, rooftop gardens, or vacant lots in city centers, while power will increasingly come from multiple sources of renewable energy. Instead of single-family homes, more residences will be built vertically. We may see buildings that contain everything that people need for their daily life, as well as smaller, self-sufficient cities focused on local and sustainable production. The future of cities is diverse, malleable, and creative, no longer built around a single industry, but reflecting an increasingly connected and global world. I think that was a very good video. What do you think about it? It was very good. It, it brings up a lot of questions about how to how to help everyone. But it's really scary, isn't it? Yep. Well, you know, there's a much more problem than comfort. Yeah. But at the same time, I think uh, the opportunity 
as far as the gospel is concerned is uh, you don't need to go very far to reach out to people. You know, just in our neighborhood. Here in the city of San Diego, there are areas, lemon growth. If you go there, there's a Massachusetts Avenue. I've been there, I went there for evangelism. If you, when you go there, I mean, you don't believe, you, you think you're not in America. I mean, there, there are some alleys, some areas in that, in that area that you would think you're either in Afghanistan or in uh, uh, Somalia or some other places there. Amazing, amazing. But unfortunately, there's very little work is done among them. The only church that I know is doing something among them is right here, Shadow Mountain, uh, trying, uh, supporting some missionaries among Somalians and also Afghan, but you know, like, just go there to Lemon Grove. Just amazing population concentration of Somalians and Afghans. Um, there is a street in Chicago we used to go and witness. We had, uh, uh, I used to go every Friday, but then we had uh, for our seminary, we had a great day of evangelism. Uh, it's called North Clark in Chicago, if you ever went to Chicago, go visit that city, to visit that street. It's an interesting street. You start from the north part of it and you go, as you go to the south part of it, you see different ethnic groups. You see Assyrian, uh, not Syrian, Assyrian from ancient Assyria. Um, you see uh, Pakistanis, you see Iranians, you see among them, you see the original Swedish people <laughs> still here and there, you find them. Uh, uh, you, you find Jewish Orthodox with their dr special dresses, um, Orthodox Jews. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating street and it's a great place of events. Uh, you used to go there and just go from the top to the bottom of that street, one into another and give tracks, talk to people, great opportunity. But also, yeah, there, there are questions of uh, stability and safety. One thing I can say, uh, the thing that makes a difference in this country versus Europe, because if you recall in France about uh, 10 years ago, they had serious riots among Algerians who were there. Uh, uh, Algeria, Algeria used to be the colony of France. So there are many Algerian immigrants there and there were riots and huge, really violent riots. Part of it is because that those immigrants were never became part of the larger culture. You know, we, when we talked about subculture, um, if that distinction continues, it can be dangerous because then you don't have a unified, you don't have a united society. You have these uh, uh, separated uh, population that have nothing to do with one another. And in fact, sometimes they are hostile to one another. But the thing in this country is number of issues. First of all, I believe because of the influence of the gospel, uh, I'm not saying that their racism doesn't exist here. I'm, I'm not making such a claim, but I think people don't know what is racism. If you want to know what's racism, go, go visit Europe. <laughs> I mean, it is, I mean, you can live in France or England uh, for all your life, but if you're not, you know, part of that larger culture, you will always consider as a foreigner, always. In this country, it doesn't matter what's the color of your skin. Uh, if you stay here a year or two years, you are part of it. I mean, so that influence of the gospel and this, um, the way that the system that accepts people and welcomes people from different cultures to come and contribute. So don't cause trouble, but if you come and contribute, you can be part of us and become a multi-billionaire, who cares? Uh, it, 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 when, yeah, as long as you 
stay within the law of the land. Uh, again, I'm not saying that there is no, absolutely there is no racism, that there is no such society on, on the face of the earth. Um, but because of the opportunity for growth, economic growth, um, far greater opportunity for education and um, the influence of gospel, that's why you don't find those rights here. When, while we have in my opinion, I think larger percentage of immigrants in comparison to, for example, Algerian in France. But over there, because they are not accepted, they don't have the same opportunity for growth economically or educationally. So they become, you have ghettos of these people. And with the ghetto comes crime. And with crime come, I mean, you have poverty and then it comes crime. And then once in a while you have these eruptions that happens. And then one issue, another issue I mentioned that on a popularly about nationalism. I ask people's view about nationalism. Now I know that in hard time <laughs> that has become a, a controversial issue, but it should. My personal opinion, it shouldn't be. I mean, um, I think nationalism has, yeah, has gotten a lot of kind of uh, bad uh, uh, publicity. But it, in my opinion, it shouldn't be. Uh, people prefer to, some people prefer to use patriot, patriotism. Fine, but I mean, that's the same as nationalism. We are just playing with war. But basically nationalism um, is the, when you are loyal, not to a king or empire, but to your nation, uh, to your culture, your history. And if that nation has an independent government, then you're loyal to your nation state. It doesn't have to be a bad, I mean, nationalism is different than racism. These two are not synonymous. That's a mistake that people make. And I don't, personally, I don't find a problem with being a nationalistic person, uh, in, it's just that in our society, that term has been unfortunately associated with white supremacists and those kind of groups. People think, oh, has gotten some kind of a bad kind of negative connotation. But it's really it's not, you know, you love your country, you love your culture, you love your uh, nation. But what concern, and I wanted to, I added a new slide and I want to talk about it. Basically, uh, what bounds or create a nation is that when you have a common nationality, uh, common ethnic ancestry, or, or like here in this country, the nationality is not based on your race, it's based on that you accept and you abide by the constitution. And, you know, to be honest with you, as long as, as to the best of my knowledge, there were only two nations in human history who were like this. One is America, that you can become part of this country if you accept and abide by the Constitution. You are an American. Of course, I mean, there may be, you know, some, you got to, uh, there are some, uh, waiting period, you have to uh, be in this country for four or five years, be able to speak English and all that, you know, those are minor things. But the main thing is that you accept the constitution and you abide by that. And the other country that I know in human history was the ancient Persian empire. Under Cyrus, people could join that empire and you would become a citizen of that empire, not because you were Persian, or because of your race or anything, as just because that you act, you have accepted the 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 law of needs and Persian, <laughs> you become a Persian uh, citizen, citizen of that empire. But you were maybe ethnically from a completely different group. <laughs> uh, and I, the only person I know that has made a comparison between these two nations and has made very interesting uh, 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 
conclusion about that is Dr. Jeremiah. Yeah, he, a few years ago, he preached a sermon on similarities between the ancient Persian uh, Empire and the modern United States, how both were, uh, had this kind of system that you become part of it because you accepted the, the, the law and also because of the love and support for Israel. The Persian, ancient Persian, Cyrus the Great and all that, they, their support for Israel and America's support for Israel. And also then he draw this conclusion that, which is true, as throughout history, uh, the Persian Empire collapsed and moved away from friendship with Israel, especially since 7th century when Islam came to Persia. And then um, animosity started rising. You see decline of Persia. And he was giving warning that that the same kind of principle can happen here. But he's the only one that I know who has made this, he has caught this similarity. You, you could uh, become an American citizen by accepting, you know, certain different things, but mainly the constitution. And you could have become the Persian citizen of the Persian empire if you would accept the, the laws of Medes and Persian and sub, you know, you become loyal to the, uh, that system of government. But so it's not necessarily an ethnic ancestry. It can be civil uh, languages. Yes, having a one common language helps, but in like again in the Persian Empire, you could the the official language was Persian, but they were people were allowed to have their own ethnic languages too. Culture, uh, you know, again having a shared way of life, history, religion. Well, again, uh, <laughs> we being Christian, we believe that the only true faith is Christianity. But also, also at the same time, I, I am of a belief that we should allow people of other faith to practice. Uh, when the Lord himself comes, he takes care of the rest. <laughs> uh, that we should leave that to his time. And of course, a certain territory. What do you think? Uh, is, do you have any comment? I'm sorry. What do you think about the issue of nationalism? Can nationalism... Can nationalism be an issue for mission? Um, sure. I mean, well, when, when you say an issue, what is, oh, is this not the question at the bottom? Why is this an issue for contemporary mission? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Well, because we all, you know, missionaries are going to come from all different backgrounds. And, and I don't, I think it's an issue if we don't have that um, that understanding of what each individual country that we're going to, what their background is, you know, all of those. Um, that, this is a tough question for me, only because when you say what is nationalism and then what is the issue, um, for me, going to Nepal, I'm going to have to know a lot of different, uh, just like here, know a lot of, a, a lot of different subcultures uh, of the country, and just like in the United States. And, and I think it's similar in that way that we just have to be open to everyone, um, what they're. Yeah. The reason I asked that question was uh, because throughout history, and especially church history, uh, and again, not that I agree with what has happened, but throughout history, Christian missionaries were in, in some parts of the world, not all everywhere, uh, they faced um, animosity from uh, groups who were very nationalistic. Like in China, they used to call missionaries, British missionaries who used to come there, white devils you know, because they would see these missionaries as agents who are invading their culture they call that cultural in, uh, invasion um, 
in the Middle East the same way. They, they would think that missionaries were agents of the British government or American government or French or whatever. Um, and they have a hidden agenda that they think, for example, in many, even today, they think if you're a Christian missionary, you are being paid by U.S. government or by CIA, and you are doing some kind of a, a, a hidden work for them. And even if your goal is just only convert people, they say, ah, oh, by doing the conversion, they are making us passive. Because, you know, when the gospel, you know, the Lord says, we, we believe in that, that um, do not seek revenge, forgiveness. I said, oh, okay, look, these guys are making us passive and nullifying our uh, nationalistic uprising, in other words. Uh, do I make sense? Yes. So basically, the issue is because because we uh, eyebrows are raised when we come in to yeah. many you places. Know, maybe not. Maybe so, I'm not saying in everywhere. In some other countries, many places, they welcome missionaries. Some, mm -hmm. some in, for example, American missionaries were welcomed in before the Islamic Revolution in many parts of Iran even an Islamic country, because they brought, uh, you know, they would, they bring the gospel, but also they help building the schools, uh, building hospitals and many other things. And especially subculture, subculture subcultural groups, like min Christian minorities uh, who were in those countries, they, they welcome missionaries because the missionaries will help them, missionaries will, assist them in their um, daily living, in their culture, uh, advancement of their little subculture. Um, and interesting, and again, I, I added a new slide. I'm not, <laughs> please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you guys should do the same thing. It, it just, uh, the, it has to be leading of the Holy Spirit. But let me also give you an example of uh, a Christian missionary who became part of a, 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 a revolution. Not, I mean, he, he was not involved in violence, but he supported a revolution in Iran. And this is something that many people don't know about. It. Back in 1906, this is 114 years ago, there was a revolution in Iran, constitutional revolution, that um, just the, gov the, the form of government would change from absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. And there were um, different groups in different parts of the country that were involved in that uprising. Now, there was a man, uh, you know, this is interesting, Right now, in you know, with all, all the things that's going on between Iran and America, very few people know this, and very few Iranians, and even very few Americans know this. There is a city in northwest of Iran called Tabriz. And in this city, near, it is almost near the border of former Soviet Union. Uh, 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 there is, in a uh, in a, um, there is a, a tomb of different martyrs of the revolution, and there is a tomb in honor of this man, Howard Buskerville, and he's considered a hero. <laughs> but uh, even many people don't know that that there is a tomb of this American school teacher who was part of the Presbyterian mission in Tabriz and uh, uh, who, he was killed for Iranian democracy during the Constitu constitutional revolution. He wasn't involved in any kind of fighting but he supported uh, now it, I put this uh, link here you can if you go on popular you can go and read more about him an American hero in Iran 
and somebody even compared him to Lafayette uh, in America, uh, who came you know, from France and supported the American Revolution. Like he came from America and he was a Christian missionary. Many people don't know about that. Uh, Presbyterian mission in Iran. Now, this is an example of a man who saw a rise of nationalism and a nationalistic movement happening in this country. And he saw the legitimate reasons uh, that these people are wanted this change and he supported them. Not taking guns, not killing people, but he supported the cause and he was killed for it. And he's buried as a martyr. <laughs> I, I'd be surprised how many Iranians know about this. <laughs> One of their national heroes is an American. <laughs> so, so it, again, I'm not saying, you know, please don't, don't take me wrong. I'm not trying to encourage anybody to uh, in wherever you're going to become part of an underground revolution. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, but there, there, is a, there is a place, there is a time that we as Christians have to stand and say, you know, this is, this is wrong. This is injustice. Uh, no, we don't take arms. We don't get involved with violence. We don't want to um, be distracted from the, our own mission, which is the gospel. But you know, there is also an example of this kind of people. Anyway, that's the end of our uh, study for this session. Do you have any question? Any comment? Thing? I hope the class was helpful. <laughs> it's so very helpful. Good. And, um, what I'd like to do once I get settled is take it again for the software and sure. actually for credit. So. Yeah, yeah and uh, you can always, uh, of course, ding. I don't know when, they, when, when I have you know, because I locked the course. Now, I don't know whether after I locked it, you can still watch the video or not. But you can also watch the video of the sessions. But if you wanted to take a course as a credit, that would be great. That would be great. All right, then let's close with a prayer. Father God, we thank you as we come to the end of this course and uh, Again, the greatest anthropologist that we know is your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came. He left the culture of heaven and he came to this sin-ridden world uh, to rescue us, to save us. And Lord, may we learn from you, may we follow in your footsteps to reach out to people and have compassion with them and to reach out to people with the truth of your gospel. Uh, bless our time, bless all the students, and may the things that we learn, as I again pray that be put into practice in our lives and ministries. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right.